Hi, welcome to the All Things LGBTQ interview show, where we interview LGBTQ guests who are making important contributions to our communities. All Things LGBTQ is taped at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which we recognize as being unceded indigenous land. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Hi, everybody in uh, All Things LGBTQ World. We're um, talking today with Rachel Desolates. I know her very well, but I am going to ask her a few questions because many people in the audience don't know. Rachel, how that's possible, I don't know, but <laughs> <laughs> so Rachel, I know you're from Maine, and and what brought you to Vermont? Um, I had a my college roommate was from Vermont, so when we had vacations, I would come up here and stay with her family, and I just fell in love with Vermont immediately, uh, and so. Lived in Boston for a while and, you know, moved to Connecticut. And I thought that, that worked for me. So I came to Vermont and settled in and I've been here ever since. And, and that's been and, in the 70s. Wow. Yeah. Incredible. So it was just like your soul place or something. Or you're, yeah. you're, you really felt comfortable. Yeah, I did too. Um, so once you got here, you had to find a job and do all that kind of stuff. I know you had an interesting career. Do you want to tell your audience just a little about that career? Well, I've had actually primar primarily two jobs. Um, one was uh, I managed an inn in Eastburg, and we had cross-country trails, like 60 kilometers. Not that I skied them, but, you know, they were certainly available for people who were staying with us and that was an interesting interesting work i got to meet lots of people and it also allowed me to stay home i had i was a single parent by that time and i was able to stay home and be with them when they weren't in school and then the other thing that i started that sold and so i started doing social service work and working as an advocate in the battered women's movement and that was fairly new i mean it was like we were really building it up at that time because very few people knew what it was. They didn't, if they did, they didn't talk about it. There was very little um, acknowledgement that it did happen uh, or it did exist. So, um, and that work, I did that for quite a few years and that progressed over the years as things started changing. Um, then our work started changing as well. And we got pretty, because we couldn't afford, I can remember when I first started working there, we had one telephone in the middle of the desk and there were five women sitting around this desk. And when the phone rang, we all took turns because we couldn't afford, you know, five desks or five phones. Yeah. So, it sounds like so crazy to have to live under those to work under those conditions, but we did it, and you know I think we did a lot of good work. Yeah, and so I, I gather from your work and and your life, and knowing you that you're an activist in the community as well. Yes, and one of the founding members of Rainbow Umbrella from Central Vermont, and um, so. We, me and Ann and your partner Paulette and you started the Rainbow Umbrella Central Vermont. And so do you want to tell our audience why we did that? And, uh, you know, what was the catalyst for that? Well, I think the catalyst was really that we were getting older and traveling to Burlington for the most part, that's the only place that was holding events and activities. And we wanted to be, you know, involved in the community. And it was really getting to be more and more difficult to go to Burlington because it was always late at night. And Weather. So we, uh, we decided to do something for us, for our cohort. And so we started Rainbow Umbrella and we started having meetings and Actually, that's been going, I don't know if you remember, Linda, but I, I was thinking about that this morning, like maybe nine, 
years, I don't know, but a Eight very years. long time. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and we have been, although our work has changed, I seem to find work that always changes, uh, which is probably not a bad thing. But anyway, um, you know, the, then our work changed, you know, as time went on. So, uh, and that's been a very interesting process as well. I so, know it started out as kind of a social group. And there were lots of people. I mean, we met so many people from this area and still have contact with, which is great. Um, and then as Trump came, it yeah. became more of a political group at that at that time, although it did have both components. Right. Yeah, we did change our focus from you know social activities. There was a lot of concern about Trump being president. And because Vermont is such a small state, it seemed like there was no reason why we couldn't come together as a state and to look at and protect some of the rights because we were really concerned about losing some of the rights and some of the progress we had made over the years. So we started an alliance, a statewide alliance, and we did work together. And that was really uh, it was a nice way to bring us all together. It's a small state, but we're also, it's not like our neighbors. If you're going to Bennington, let's say you're still traveling a couple of hours. So it was a nice way to bring us together. And even during COVID, we were meeting, uh, you know, thank goodness for Zoom. Yeah. And, and, and the work continued. And we also had a couple of members who were liaisons to the governor. And so we were able to, you know, keep on top of what kinds of legislation they were looking at, making sure that language was the way that really spoke to who we were and what we needed. And I think that was really, and Keith and Brenda were part, or the two liaisons, and Keith had been involved with the uh, legislature for a long time, so. And for the people who don't know, it's Keith Gosland and Brenda Churchill, correct? Who, and Brenda yes. Churchill yes. Was, was liaison to the governor, correct, right? Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so that was a great service right there. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, I, it was also, it, we because we had to sort of figure out how we were gonna work together because every organization has its own little quirky way of doing things. And, and that was, because uh, I'm all into process. I'm really interested in how things manifest and where they go. And, and so that was interesting. And the thing is, we are not, Rainbow Umbrellas are grassroots. Uh, we started as a grassroots organization, so we don't have paid staff. And I think now there might be a couple of other organizations, like I think Bennington is also organized uh, through grassroots uh, philosophy. But, um, you know, everyone else has brick and mortar. They've got money to be able to hire staff. So, you know, you were really have, you were having to work with people with different abilities and also uh, you know people just learn to what was their strength and tapping into that and being able to have a nice working relationship yeah because even though the state is small the the demographics of different communities can be really really different yes um, you know, rutland's different from you know Montpelier. i mean it has its own kind of uh personality yeah. You know? And so it was really important to be in touch with what was going on in other parts of the state. Yeah, you're right. And the other thing, too, the other challenge for us in Vermont, and it's also, you know, a plus because we moved here because it's rural, right? It's not densely populated. And that is one of the things that draws us to Vermont yet to do the kind of work that we're doing presents us with a challenge because it's really very difficult to get into those outlaying towns. So, yeah. uh, Lots of yeah. people are isolated in the country, um, you know, uh, especially older LGBTQ people. So yeah, 
So I know it's been a lifeline to many people in the community. So I'm glad yeah. I'm glad you're doing that. Um, yeah. so movies. Now we're going to get into movies Ooh. and your involvement. I know in um, the Savoy doing a what are they calling it now? Do you know? Like, is this the pride? Uh, queer Montpelier. Montpe Montpelier Pride is the umbrella for the whole okay. weekend, the first weekend in June. And then my role is working with the film committee and we're doing a film festival. So that's been pretty exciting. And that's why I was interested also in coming onto your show because you and I have been going to movies like to yeah. the go-to Savoy Theater in Montpelier, which is the Savoy. And, uh, you know, we've been doing that for years. And then after the movies, we'd always, you know, just chat about the movies and have some, you know, good conversations that would either Jenna, enhance yeah. the, the experience or it changed our mind about the, the film. So, yeah. you know, I think that uh, being able to do this and with you, it just seemed like a natural fit because, you know, we were like, you know, it was just something that we had been doing. So I really appreciate you doing that. And so how did you get involved with this particular group? Uh, well, um, we wanted to, well, let me step back. I think you just love before, movies. I love movies, yeah. yeah. And, and uh, but one of the things is the other thing that Rainbow Umbrella did is that we started organizing a film festival like three or four years ago. And COVID came. Yeah. And here we were <laughs> yeah. spending months and months. I mean, the nice thing about it is we got to watch a lot of movies. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Once we got the selection of films that we wanted to show um, and starting producing, uh, you know, publicity um, and ads for promoting the film festival, we were all then told that we couldn't get, you know, we couldn't leave. We were housebound, more or less. Uh, well, not less, more. <laughs> and um, so it never happened. And then when this came along, I thought, hmm, this will be a nice way to bring that film festival to a close as well. So I really jumped on it and it's been fun. I've been working with some really gifted and some really talented people. So when you talk about, um, when you talk about the love of movies, I've always defined it with three categories. There are movie fans, and then there are movie or film lovers. Yeah. And then you have your cinephiles, right? Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know that I know enough to be a cinephile, but that doesn't stop me uh, yeah. from going to films because there's always so much to learn and it goes beyond just the theme of the film, but also you start looking at the cinematography, you know, and, and, and it, becomes, it just enhances your experience of watching a film. So I started working with uh, these talented people and they were really committed to having a good program and one that was expansive so that it could show case queerness uh, in front of the camera, but also behind the camera, because we have a, a film where the two directors are queer. So, and people, a lot of people don't know that. So it's that kind of thing, I think, where people will learn more about these films as well, uh, because after each film, we're hoping to have a little, either a Q and A or a discussion. So um, how many movies are there going to be shown? Well, we have one starting on the Friday. I, let me think of what day is that? That's June 2nd. Okay, June 2nd. Yeah. And so what we're doing is featuring The Matrix, uh -huh. which I'm probably the only one who hasn't seen it. 
but I guess it's a, you know, a, a big film that people are really enjoying. And we're also hoping to get younger people to attend the Savoy and also to be involved because some of these films really speak to them. Yeah. So um, I think you're going to be pleased with the range of films that we're showing. But that's going to be the first one. And, and, and the others? Uh, have and you then, well, we have some more on, on Sundays. We'll be all afternoon, Sunday afternoon. But before that, on Wednesday, there are going to be events all day long in Montpelier City. And I think, is it Cal coming to do a show with Ann to talk about that? Because I know very little. I think he has an interview with Ann um, yes. to talk about the activities on Saturday, but on Sunday, again, I don't have times because that's like- uh, In the future. In the future, it's a work in progress. And yeah. we'll have, hopefully we'll have posters next year, next week, uh, showing the films and also the times. But one, the first film I think that we'll be showing is, um, oh, Liz and the Bluebird. Oh. I've, I've never heard the other, I, and I'm learning a lot from these folks uh, who are on the, the committee, but it's an animation and that's pretty big as well. And it was interesting because I was sort of looking at what we were organizing four years ago, looking at it through the lens of seniors, right? Because it was Rainbow Umbrella who was sponsoring it. Absolutely. And, and now I'm working with a completely different team of people. And so the films that are coming forward are films that I've never seen and also possibly don't know a whole lot about. So yeah. I'm being introduced to things like anime and manga. And it's like, they're so patient in teaching me all of this. And, that, and it's really exciting. Yeah. So that, that's going to be the first one on Sunday. I, another film that we're going to, oh, and that one is PG uh, content rating also um, for your viewers who are wondering whether or not this is for kids because kids are really into animation. Um, another movie will be Paris is Burning, which is our one documentary. And that focuses on drag queens in New York City uh, in the mid to late 80s. Uh, and then, of course, this is my favorite, Desert Hearts. <laughs> and too. yours too? Oh, God. I, know. I wish we had known each other back then. <laughs> I know that movie was out, what, in the 80s? Early 80s? 80, yeah, 85. Wow. And, and it, it was, was the. the yeah. It was the first film, lesbian film, yeah. that was shown on uh, mainstream, in mainstream theaters. Yeah. So it was a big deal for us. I mean, I still sometimes am amazed. And it was also, it had, you know, a fairly decent ending. Uh, yeah. I'm like, you know, in romance, there's always a breakup. And, and it, you know, so this really brought something very different to the lesbian community. And also it was exposing for the first time uh, to the entire public that, you know, about queer, queer people. And so that was, that, that'll that be fun. I think that'll yeah. be a fun. And, and, you know, like I'm interested to see about what I feel about it now is how I felt about it in my thirties. Yeah. Um, you know, first coming yeah. out. It will be interesting because I haven't looked at it again. I'll look at it before it shows, but I need to look at it again. And it also, when I was talking with the committee members, none of them knew about it. Yeah. And so I think it'll be interesting. And what I'm hearing from them is, you know, that generation is not necessarily happy with what's coming out of Hollywood now. And they're more interested in old films that also gives some type of history. And I think Desert Heart will certainly, you'll be thinking of, uh, you know, today and the privileges that we have today compared to what it was like in 85. So, and then lastly, 
um, we're going to be showing we're all going to the World's Fair. Uh -huh. and so although it's classified in the horror drama genre, my understanding it's, is that it's not one of those jump scare movies and that it's more psychological. So Mr. Sitch is seeing that as well. Yeah. So it might be like in the, well, no, I guess that was, that wasn't a game movie, but Out was, uh, Get Out was pretty. Yes. Yeah. Um, so uh, I guess that would have been classified as a horror film too on some level. But anyway, <laughs> I'm interested to see them all. I haven't seen any except Desert Hearts. So um, advertising will go out and, um, you know, they I'm sure they have their newsletter and, um, if there's anything you want us to put up on the show uh, for who to contact for information, we can do that. Uh, and we can also put their website on. I'm sure the mm -hmm. support has a website, right? So, um, okay, well, this is all very exciting. And I think Pride this year is going to be incredible. I think um, so too. There's all kinds of stuff going on and people are making huge efforts yeah. to get this off the ground. So, and oh. if I can just add one more thing yeah. with the with the Desert Hearts movie, Rainbow Umbrella has donated money to the Savoy so that anyone in the you know LGBTQ community who can't afford movies, then this will help a little bit to get them in because we really are committed to make things available and accessible to to yes. the entire community. So thank and you for letting me plug, make that plug. And they're also doing a panel, right? I forgot yes. about that. Yes, yes. yes the you, panel. you and I, believe it or not, we're still stuck together. <laughs> <laughs> we're still going, girl. Yeah, we're still, we're still there. <laughs> we're in. <laughs> yeah. So thank you so much for coming on and letting our audience know about the festival and uh, the other activities and uh, we'll direct them to the right place. And thanks, Rachel. Oh, thanks, Linda. We'll see you at the next, what is it? What did Ebert and Siskel, how did they end there? Yeah. <laughs> I can't remember. See you at the movies or something See like you that. at the movies. <laughs> see you at the discussion group. All right. Bye -bye. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Hi, everybody. I'm here with Kel Arbor, an uh, important person around Vermont. <laughs> Kel has more energy than a lot of people I know, certainly more than I. Um, welcome, Kel. Thanks so much for having me, Anne. You know, I was looking at our, I was reviewing old shows, and this is your fourth appearance, I oh, think. Oh, really? Oh, that's so funny. Did I do one as Vermont Cares? You did one as Vermont Cares. You did one as the Pride Center. And you did one as the Central Vermont Pride. Oh, yes, yes. Which is the incarnation you're inhabiting today. Yep. Um, this is exciting times. I have to clarify, we're taping on May 11th, and the festival is going to occur on June 3rd. Mm -hmm. And this show is going to air on May 27th, awesome. right before. That's so cool. everyone can, you know, prepare. Yeah. So I don't know if all the details are entirely nailed down, but uh, let me describe it as you've described it thus far on Facebook. Montpelier Pride Fest, Saturday, Saturday June 3rd, uh, kicking off with a sidewalk parade at one, music, lawn games, hangout, nonprofit resources, and more. Events all week, this is so cool, Connecting to Barry Pride, June 10th. Come out and wiggle your rainbows. Um, you mentioned the Pride Center Vermont calen events calendar for full coverage. Um, and you also mentioned community hosts and sponsors, including Fox Market, Rainbow Umbrella of Central Vermont, a worthy organization, if I do say so, the Savoy Theater, uh, Bar Hilligan. Mm -hmm. And um, 
the Vermont symphonies. And I know a lot of people were drawn to the symphony component last year. So this is great. Super excited. We were so grateful that the symphony could get another grant to have another free concert. It was one of our most well-attended events last year and a lot of intergenerational attendees, which is always great to see the love of music and art intersects all of our communities. Exactly. Um, I want to ask you, you and your colleague, Elaine Ball, were sort of responsible for doing it last year at a very um, successful Pride Fest on the State House lawn. What have you? What did you learn from that experience, and what are you? What are you going to do differently this time? Do you think? Totally. We last year, um, Elaine and I connected. I had done a queer field day on the state house lawn, really casually, a couple of years ago, and just always notice how simple containers bring us together to let us emerge with what we need to have some active. I call it activity light. We've got some stuff going on, but it's really to get together. And then I heard Elaine was out there trying to brew, um, reinvigorate Montpelier Pride, which has happened way back. And there was the Stonewall gathering that you all had hosted. And we have a large rainbow community. So Elaine and I um, had many community convos with not a lot of other organizing core people, but we've gotten a lot of community feedback. I've been doing bike rides through Montpelier. Um, we kick off on Friday night with a queer critical mass bike ride. And for me, that's been a long standing, really fun event around Montpelier. We had 50 riders come out for that last year. It was amazing. And to bring in the Savoy Theater to do another film fest, we're always excited to collaborate with James and the Savoy. So we knew those were things that worked last year, but adjusting the... Um, the film fest with the Savoy that there were more community collaborators. So I've been poking people around specific events. Not a lot of folks want to get involved at the like core core. That's part of why Pride Center took it on as a program last year was to help hold some of the structure with tent permits and insurance. The, the boring yeah. stuff, the boring stuff. And then that the community can come in and do the fun stuff, plan the films, um and run the events that's been successful so we look to do more of that in the future and engage folks it was we had a lot of people last year that wanted a parade and a parade and shutting down the street is uh you have to have a police presence and we do not want to have police presence at any of our fests because there is so much harm that comes from the police that seeing cop cars and people with badges and guns is not a safer space for so many of our folks. So we work with community safety teams, de-escalators, traffic control to do that tending and help hold. And then we're doing our parade as a sidewalk parade. So we don't shut down the street. We take the sidewalks and then during the main and state street intersection, there's a 15 second all stop at the intersections. We did a 15 second flash mob dance party. Okay. <laughs> it was just so fun. So I love to encourage those edges of staying within legality, but pushing the edges of how we take up space. And that was something that we brought back again this year was the parade and it's gonna kick off the fest. So we'll organize and parade at one o'clock, and then we'll circle back to start the music and other entertainment and um, resource tabling at the State House lawn. We've got a few different musical performers. We're still locking in some of our um, performer acts, and then we've got a handful of resource tablers, Planned Parenthood, ACLU, Mosaic, Washington County Mental Health Services, Pride Center will be there. Um, we did not have enough rainbow flags to sell last year. We didn't bring any out really to sell. So we'll do that this year so that we'll have some. We've got the progress pride flag and the trans flags and the non-binary flags for folks that want to purchase day of. So that was an adjustment. It was a community ask to have the Bar Hill party last year. So we worked that in with the budget as an after party on Sunday and Dyke Night in Burlington's going to host it. So it's open to all genders, but to have Dyke Night um, help host it will be a really fun collab 
with Bar Hill, and then Savoy will do a Sunday Film Fest too. Fox Market has a dance party Saturday night, and the Symphony moved their show to Saturday night. So that will be a nice all day Saturday with the fest, the symphony, the dance party. And then there's the poetry event that Rainbow Umbrella is co-sponsoring with Robin Joy. There's the one at Kellogg Hubbard on the 7th, on the Wednesday in between. And then I hope there's other small community pop-up stuff during that week into the Berry Pride on Saturday, June 10th. They have a drag queen story hour. There's another bike ride that weekend. So I chat with Erica and we try to collaborate. We set those dates weekend back to back so that folks could enjoy more of a central Vermont presence. I know Plainfield's doing a big queer craft fair in late August with sort of a festival appeal. So it's cool to see the small ones pop up and we've kept Montpelier on the smaller like let's keep it simple. We love badminton. We love our local resources, but we can't sell stuff on the state house lawn anyways. And we don't want big for-profit rainbow washing. This is for the community and centering what we need um, and giving people some access. We'll get that big tent again um, from Natasha um, and Ethan Bogar, beautiful homemade tent with maiden hair, maiden hair ferns screen printed on it. So there'll be some shelter from the weather. We learned what folks liked last year and just like observed what was like easy, who are our go-to like hangout spaces that we already love and enjoy and building up our partnerships there and keeping that, um, that the mic is, it's not a speak out day. This is a day to really just enjoy and gather and have fun and celebrate to have no political speakers at the mic. I saw political folks last year, they came out to the bike ride. They were working the crowd in that relationship way. And for me, that's more impactful. They had their shirts and they marched in the parade with us. That was a nice political gathering. And then to focus on art and hanging out together. And Can they have tables at the uh, festival? I, yeah, I think we'd be open to like political tables, Elaine, um, through the Facebook page. Um, people can connect to me too at my Pride Center email and Elaine's doing the tabling um, focus. We're really focused on nonprofit local resources, but we're open. We're not trying to gatekeep people out, but we are trying to be really mindful. Last year, we didn't put anybody's logos on the poster because we logos even one cute logo turns the community off and makes it feel corporate so we yes. like really slowly tried to shift that out so it's like the only major sponsorship piece that we can offer out to a group is a logo on the poster we don't have like big offerings out of the pride fest so that really is like two thousand dollars or more sponsors um <clears throat> to keep that really like low barrier and then using the QR code to have people go to the calendar page with all the listings where then we can web link you to the Savoy page, to the Bar Hill page. Um, and we're still working out some of those like flow pieces. Some people are on Facebook. Some people want to see a poster in person. Some people just want to hear about it word of mouth. So, oh. we're, you know, marketing through all the networks. And we are, oh, we're so hopeful to print a banner for the light poles. We're working with Montpelier Alive. They did give us a grant again this year. And we hope to print those light pole banners so that we can have a Montpelier Pride image that we can reuse year after year. I don't know that we'll be able to get the flags on the flag poles again upstate in Maine, but that was a really high impact for me last year. Uh -huh. Flying those progress flags. So you're planning for the future, even, you know, beyond this event on the third. That's fabulous. Yeah, yeah we really want to like, we picked early June because so much happens at the end of June. And then the big Burlington Pride is in September. That works for us to have the big fest off of all the other smaller. And then Essex is doing their first Pride this year. They're also on June 3rd. And it's really cool to see from tip to tail of June Little Pride Fest, Big Pride Fest all over the state of Vermont, Springfield, Newport, Brattleboro, Essex are all having their first Pride this year. 
That is fabulous. That's really encouraging. And I love, I love that. that you're having uh, the Central Vermont events in the beginning of the month, because my partner and I usually go um, to New York for the Dyke yep. Month. And, all that. and it's, you know, um, it's the same kind of thing. The whole um, area is percolating with pride for all month and then, you know, theoretically beyond that. So, Kelly, you're doing great work. So Thank you so much. We're trying and I think we're, there's always things that we learn as we go and how to, even if we're not getting community members out at our scheduled meetings to organize, how do we get that community feedback? And that's how do we do that earlier in the year, meet with some of those groups or have those easy ways to say, this is what I want, this is what's missing, um, so that we can put that programming in because the Pride Center, all of our programming comes out of community need and it's really important. I mean, it's good feedback to know what's not working, but I more want to know what people want. Like, what do you want to see for an event? I don't um, drink alcohol hardly at all anymore. So having non-bar centered, non-bar centered events, like, yep, we've got our couple bar takeovers, but all that other stuff too, that is multi-generational is not in an alcohol venue, is during the day. Lovely. Um, you have um, three of the national concerns are police presence, uh, politicians, and corporate funding. And it seems like you've got very clear positions on that. Do you accept corporate funding? It's something Elaine and I talked about this year with, are there, when I think about budgets, I think about how much do we need for the event? And let's find that amount of money. Let's not just get money to get money. That doesn't work for me. And you're more apt to get people that just want to like throw money at you, put a logo on their poster and check it off their list. I don't want that. I personally want to see building up relationships and developing up. Fox Market is a great community support space. And so they've been a really great sponsor to court. They do a month of um, tips. They give us their tips for the month. The Symphony Orchestra, they were so wonderful. That's a, that's a pretty big like nonprofit sponsor. I would love to see Darn Tough get in down the road. I know they're a really great LGBT friendly workspace. Same with National Life. I think we're, we're just not sure how, and we're not connected to those places with their development teams, but we want, if there's going to be corporations that their value aligned with us and the police are not value aligned in terms of how, how much harm comes out of that institution and how the police have come up through slavery and locking up black and brown bodies. So standing up and with racial justice, being gender inclusive, being multi-generational that young, that it feels like it's something for young people and for those of us who are older um, can be complex. So trying to move slow and work with the networks that we pre-existing have and then build up as we go. But I haven't found a big sponsor around Montpelier that really makes sense. There's not. I know. And, you know, to generalize the whole corporate approach, I was talking to a friend yesterday who was part of organizing the Las Vegas Pride. And he was saying, you know, they had merchandise and the corporate sponsors wanted to add, you know, so they could make a profit, you know, yeah. jack up the price for the merchandise. And, you know, like you, he said, no, you know, this is a community event. We don't want to do that. So, you know, yeah. it's a complex, it's complex, as you say. It is complex. And partially us using the state house lawn locks us <laughs> into something that you can only sell on the state house lawn if you're part of the farmer's market. So Carrier Coffee can come over and sell. Um, there's somebody who we invite over. So there's not really a lot of vendors that can come out and actually sell wares. And having that, you just made me think about, oh, um, Hannaford, I think has been a great example of when I started at the Pride Center last year, yeah. I had curiosity around how do we use our rainbow power to help positive peer pressure, call in Hannaford, to just engage with talks around milk with dignity? How do we use pride as a carrot was my ask. 
to Mike um, Bensel, our um, exited executive director. And Mike started that conversation with migrant justice. And the word from other orgs is, we don't recommend you don't take the money, but we were like, but we don't need to take their money. And us not taking that sponsorship, sure, we'll have to find that money elsewhere, but the value of our relationship with migrant justice is so much bigger than dollars. And yeah. that opportunity to call in Hannaford that we could do some pressure that isn't putting pressure on workers to do a, a strike. Workers shouldn't have to strike. We can community boycott though. I don't ask for donations from Hannaford. I, if somebody wants a food card as an incentive from Hannaford, I will honor that, but I'll also ask, is there another grocery store peeling their labels off of donated food could be another strategy too, so that you get the food, but you don't get their branding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's really good. I'm totally in favor. I boycott a lot of things, but I'm usually just one person. Right. And and how many, I mean, the, the Hannaford love tote with the rainbow, with the love, how often do I see that out there? Because we want to flag ourselves as LGBTQIA2S plus people. So we carry their merch, but it's a PowerPoint that if I have to shop at Hannaford for whatever reason, I don't have to be branded by Hannaford. Right, right. So back to the festival, are you going to have one MC? I can't read it. Seemed like you had one MC last year. Oh, um, that's an adjustment too, Anne. I always am wearing 17 hats and then have to do 12 other things. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so well, this year we'll have a, um, somebody running sound. A local person is going to do the sound. We've got a couple um, local community supports um, for the mic to help performers and just intro the couple of acts. And then um, Elaine will do like a little welcome intro as the parade comes back. And hopefully I'll just be tabling and schmoozing the crowd and hanging out. Um, I remember you distributed water. Like, yes, at one point I was giving out water. Oh, it was great. It was a wonderful <laughs> service. <laughs> yeah, it was so nice. There was a local community person that bought a couple of cases of water for us to give out and a couple of med kits so wonderful it's like we there's so much support we i think we had three to five hundred people throughout the day come through the fest last year we we put it right after the farmer's market so there's already folks downtown it's sort of the buzz of the time during the day on a saturday mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's free parking on saturdays in montpelier so it's that's nice <laughs> <laughs> so it's the parade's going to start at the state house and then what's its route it's we'll go down we start at the state house at that upper road and go back um through the downside is that into is it school street that goes across one of those bridges it's like that upper road that cuts like behind um goes by the laundromat and then across the bridge to main street i think it's school street um we'll yeah, loop yeah. That. yeah not Elm, but the one just below it, and not Langdon, the one between Langdon and Elm. And then we'll come down Main Street, break across all four of those intersections to do our little dance moment <laughs> in the cross. I love, <laughs> I love encouraging feistiness with the youth. And then we'll continue down the sidewalk and loop back in the front side of the park from the State Street side so that the fest can welcome us back in. We'll parade back into it. We had over we had over a hundred people in the parade last year, which was so cool to see the excitement. So I'll bring my big flags again, and we love when people dress up. The youth always look the best. <laughs> I know, I know. Oh, Cal, this is really fabulous and very exciting. I'm um, super psyched. What are your last words? Any other comments? Encourage people to come, of course. You yeah. Yeah, just to come out to any of the events. For me, Pride is a season of reconnecting and connecting to community. Sometimes we move here, especially through the pandemic, and we don't know anybody yet. So I, last year, I met so many people that had moved. And to be able to do that welcome, that hi, now you know somebody in your local community. We're not trying to draw people from all over, although, yeah, that's great. Like, 
it's a cool destination event. I've never been to Montpelier. Great, I'll go for Pride. Uh -huh. But we really want it to be centered around the local, local Centre Vermont community that if you don't feel isolated, that is life-saving. So just knowing that there's rainbow community in your community, even if you don't see them all the time, that really can uh, fuel somebody's sustainability to live in our community. And it's so festive. I mean, there's no, um, at least from my experience, there's no, it's not a cruising scene. It's not a bar scene. It's just fun. <laughs> It's just fun. And you can cruise if you want to cruise and course, you casually. <laughs> it was the, the badminton was like, I literally had to take the badminton out of children's hands at the end of the day. <laughs> as soon as I put it up, I was like, oh, I love that we love badminton so much. That's so fun. <laughs> well, Kel, this has been fabulous. I'm very psyched up. I'm certainly going to be there. We were there last time and um will be again. So, and thank you for doing this. This is a great service for all of us and it's fun. Understood. My, my pleasure, Anne. I, I've got to find out the date from Keith when we, there is a first pride that happened in Vermont that probably wasn't Burlington, even though there's been a lot of 1983 was the first, that was Burlington's first pride parade. But when was Vermont's first pride? So I'm, I'm on a sleuthing mission. It feels very aligned for the Pride Center that we would help bolster and hold Montpelier as the capital, as a community that doesn't really have a strong set of organizing in this moment in time, um, that I could help be that person as someone who lives in that town and works at the Pride Center to hopefully help get those local folks that want to do a long-term Pride planning it's most powerful, I find, when we organize our own events and not for profit. Exactly, not for profit, underscore. Not for profit. Yeah, yep. we are not doing this for profit. We're doing this to be able to get the money to do next year's fest. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And none of us get paid. So, right. Know. But it's not about that, as you say. Well, I agree entirely, Kel. You're forced for good in central Vermont and elsewhere. So thanks for doing all you do. Likewise, Anne. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. And until next time, remember, resist.